ahead and get started and I'll admit people as they arrive. Um, so welcome to Coffee and Culture. This is a project of the Who's Family Art Gallery. My name is Kayla Bisbee and I am pleased to introduce our guest this morning. Um, and I hope you brought your coffee. Elizabeth Skalka is a student at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts on track to earn her master's degree in art history. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Maryland Institute College of Art, where she graduated cum laude, majoring in art history, theory, and criticism with a concentration in curatorial studies. Before moving to New York to pursue her master's, Elizabeth lived in Chicago, where she worked at a number of art museums and galleries and taught art classes for school-aged children. Elizabeth's research focus is global contemporary art, specifically focusing on global art exhibitions like biennials. The subject of her undergraduate thesis was the 2015 Venice Biennale, which looked at the politics of the ever expanding canon of art. Today, Elizabeth will lead us in a program that introduces the study of art history and teaches what to look for when assessing fine art. She will share what she believes to be some of the most important artworks, as well as common methodologies for interpretation. Everyone is going to be muted while Elizabeth gives her presentation, but I do encourage you to utilize the chat box to ask questions. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can all see my presentation. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Scalco. You can call me Lizzie. I'm an NYU graduate student earning my MA in art history, albeit from home. And my research focus is on modern and contemporary art. So basically everything after the 1850s. So today I'll be talking to you about the field of art history. What is it? Why is it useful? What can we learn from it? The big question that we grapple with is what is art? Um, in order to break down the subject of art history, we first need to know what we're talking about. Art can be many things. For example, it can be something that had a use, an artifact or an element of design. The object you're looking at here is an embroidered panel for a cabinet door. It wasn't created to be hung on a wall like an artwork, but it certainly is an image which took skill to execute. Art can also be an image for religious devotion, maybe commissioned by a patron. Or it can be an object that was specifically made to be put in a museum. Later artworks might not even be an object at all, but an experience where all that's left is documentation of a performance. There are certain elements of artworks that help inform an art historian's understanding of the piece. For one, we need to know how an artwork was made, meaning what materials were used and what techniques were employed to create it. Next, we need to know who made it. Was it a trained artist, a layman, one person, or a group? The artist's personal narrative may come into play and help give us context. We'll also need to know why it was made. Much Western, which in this case means European and American art, was commissioned for a patron or by a church. Perhaps it was designed for a specific use. All of this is important to think about. Finally, we'll need to know who it was made for. An artwork could be made for a person, for a museum, for the artist's own use, or for some public space. This factors into the context and the purpose of the artwork. Looking at and interpreting artwork can help us understand the values of a society or a group of people, the political and religious circumstances under which it was made, the personal narrative or the state of mind of the artist, in the state of artistic development during any given period of time. Take for example, example this painting by the Italian artist Fra Angelico, completed in 1434. There's an obvious religious theme, which is the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel tells the Virgin Mary that she will conceive the Son of God, but there's more to look at. At this time, in the 1430s, Italian artists were learning about perspective, that images recede into space. Here we can see small figures in the background, which demonstrates the artist's mastery of figures in deep space. We can also see an understanding of architecture with the main figure sitting in a convincing interior setting. All of this points to the state of artistic development in the early Renaissance in Italy. However, take a look at this image made in the exact same year. 
this painting had almost no religious symbols at all and seems to be a simple portrait of a man and his wife. That's where historical context comes in. This painting by Jan van Eyck was made in the Netherlands just before the Protestant Reformation. In Northern Europe, religious scenes were already out of fashion and artists often depicted daily life instead. Because overtly religious symbols were frowned upon, artists filled their painting with hidden symbols, small, seemingly innocuous objects that had either religious or symbolic meaning. Here are some close-up details of the same painting. On the back wall behind the couple, we can see a mirror which reflects the back of the couple as well as the artist himself. So you see that blue figure in the center. This is considered to be one of the first self-portraits in history, and the mirror itself is no bigger than a dime. On the outside of the mirror, Van Eyck has painted scenes from the cross, almost imperceptible to the human eye. These would have been painted with a single hairbrush. The other symbols he hid around the room have to do with the couple's marriage, fruit on the window representing fertility, and the little dog on the floor to represent fidelity. As you can see, the Van Eyck painting and the Fra Angelico painting have completely different meanings, subjects, and focuses. Art historians compare artworks to find their similarities and differences in order to find out what makes each artwork unique. As someone who studies modern and contemporary art, I find a particularly big turning point to be the 1850s, what we call the invention of modernism. Before that, most artwork was commissioned, meaning it was always made for someone, never just because. It was often either religious or portraiture, and mostly the people who got to see the artwork were rich or educated, or both. Remember, this was before public museums, so the majority of people didn't see a lot of fine art. Modernism came about for a lot of different reasons. For one, the camera was invented, meaning that people who would have hired artists to paint their portraits didn't need to. They could have their portrait taken in an instant and for much cheaper. Second, several influential countries launched revolutions, renouncing their elite. For that reason, there wasn't an aristocratic class to patronize the arts. And third, the invention of portable paints in jars and tubes meant that artists could leave the studio and paint wherever they wanted. This completely changed the way that artists approach their work. When modernism first started out, artists wanted to paint everyday life. They were so used to painting royals and elites, people who would pose in the same position for hours, that painting regular people going about their daily lives was an exciting new challenge. Suddenly, artists could paint what they were feeling, not just what they were being paid to paint. So work started looking expressive, telling stories about the artists, making the audience feel what the painter was feeling. Many artists at this time, like these two, Otto Dix on the left and Kathy Colwitz on the right, were reacting to the First World War, and you can see the anguish and terror in these images. Soon artists were experimenting with new techniques and new styles. But some were questioning what painting was anyway. Back in the Renaissance, paintings were supposed to look exactly like reality. A canvas wasn't a flat surface, but a window to the world. So now, in the modern era, artists were starting to think about the mode of painting. What if my artwork didn't recede into space, like a Fra Angelico? What if it was flat and all the paint sat on the surface? What if I didn't control my paint and instead I splashed it all over the canvas? Some argue that abstract expressionism, paintings like these two, are the only honest paintings. The paint looks and acts like paint. It's a liquid pigment, and it's not pretending to be anything else. Artists began reading and writing substantially in the early 20th century. They knew they were doing things that no one had ever done before. They were asking each other questions like, what makes a painting? What is art? And who is an artist? they started looking at philosophers like Freud, Hegel, Kant, and Foucault. They began writing manifestos for future artists. Art became conceptual. Today, art can be in any medium, painting, sculpture, digital, performance, anything. It tends to be aware of its audience because for the first time, art is being made for the purpose of being put in museums. 
and it asks a lot of questions. So for this part, uh, I think we can unmute people because we're going to do a little bit of a question and answer. Is there a way to unmute people? Talking about art. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, the 1400s. No. So if we could try not to talk over each other, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to the group. Um, I want you to look at this image and think about it like an art historian might. Yeah. What do you know about I this image? In the chair. What do you want to know about it? What do you notice? How would you describe it? And what does it remind you of? Does anyone have any input? What you look at, yes, what you If you don't want to shout it out, you can also put it in the comments. Frida Kahlo. Yes, it is a self-portrait by Frida Kahlo. Um, what information do you think is missing? What do you want to know about the image? At what point in her life was this painted? So it's 1940, I see, but I don't know what was going on in her life in 1940. That's an excellent question, um, and I can answer that for you. Um, in 1940, she had just had a big fight with her husband, Diego Rivera. Um, he was always cheating on her, but in fairness, she was cheating on him too. Um, but this for her was the final straw, and she had just divorced him. Um, so it's kind of led to a turning point in her career. What it looked like. <laughs> Your question, what's the question? Does anyone else have anything to add? Uh, Elizabeth, I have a comment. It's sure. obvious that she's trying to look like a man and uh, dr dressing and cutting off her hair like a man. So this is clearly a statement on uh, wanting to have the rights of men. And that might be a total reaction to the ability of her husband to go and do what he did, but her, not hers. Uh, well, there's a lot of, she is dressed like a man. Uh, some say that that could be Diego's suit that she's wearing. Um, she's cut her hair off. Um, even though it looks like she's wearing high heels, those are actually men's shoes, um, fashionable at the period. Um, but if you look at the top of the painting, there's a song. It was a pretty common song in Mexico at the time. And the lyrics say, if I ever loved you, it was for your hair. Now that I'm without it, now that you're without it, I no longer love you. And so basically uh, what Frida is doing here is punishing Diego um, by making herself ugly or unappealing to him and turning herself into a man, something he would not desire. Um, but there are elements of gender politics at play. It's a great piece of information to know. Thanks. Sure. Um, I think that's it for my presentation, unless anyone has any more questions. I can stop sharing my screen now. Sure. Does anyone else have anything to add or any questions for Elizabeth? Sorry, Lizzie. Question. Go ahead. Um, Lizzie, you mentioned that um, they had more access to paint once it became available in tubes and in jars. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, have... it wasn't an issue of access. Um, paint is basically two things. There's always um, pigment, which is powdered, and then there's a binding agent. So an oil paint, that's oil, um, and that's the most common. Um, in the 70s, it was acrylic, so it was more of a plastic base. Um, but in order to make paint, you had to do it in your studio. It was a matter of mixing together all of the different powder pigments with the oil, and it took hours and hours. You usually had an assistant do it. So putting it in tubes was a big turning point because it meant that you could paint wherever. You didn't have to stay indoors in your own studio. Um, so that's where in plain air painting comes from. If you've ever heard of that um, during the Impressionist age, it's when artists were starting to go paint um, landscapes out in the open for the first time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, 
Well, in that case, um, Elizabeth, on behalf of the JCC, I want to thank you for joining us today for such a really interesting and educational program. Um, and thank you to all of our guests. I do hope you plan to continue joining us every week and ask your friends to join us as well. Next week, we will hear from local artist Judy Sirota Rosenthal. We will enjoy a variety of her beautiful work. Uh, make sure to keep an eye on our websites for more upcoming events. Like this afternoon, we have a J-Screen presentation sponsored by Women's Philanthropy at three o'clock. Um, tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, we have a Women's Philanthropy Laheim. It's just an opportunity for ladies to get together like this face to face and just have a chat before we uh, move into Shabbat. So I hope you all stay well. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.